At the UPS Store, we know being a small business owner means holiday time is still go time. Still get those orders shipped time. And still re-up on stamps and supplies time. That's why this upcoming holiday, while others close up shop, we'll be open. And happy to help you keep being unstoppable. Come into your local store today. Most locations are independently owned. Product services, pricing, and hours of operation may vary. See center for details. The UPS Store. Be unstoppable. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? When the wolf is at your door, you're running so that's for sure. This episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast may contain descriptions of acts of violence or that of a sexual nature and should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off of the internet or for some television show. The facts I'm retelling you were presented to me by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My descriptions of the crime scenes, what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. Um, Today, we're going to be doing a continuation on who murdered Courtney Coco and y'all know I don't use scripts and this is going to be unedited. So the lip smacking or heavy breathing or, you know, whatever you may hear, you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, I'm in the room today with all of Courtney's dearest family. I can't say all of them, but I'm in a room today with, uh, um, some of Courtney's dearest family members, and I'm going to go around and introduce you to them in a minute. Um, I just want to talk to y'all about this and how huge it is that you continue to show the support lifers that you've done since we released the episode last week with Miss Stephanie uh, and Jim and I when, when she was on the phone. Now, Courtney's case will be 15 years old in less than three weeks, y'all. Uh, two two weeks, two and a half weeks. All right. So it's not cold. It's frozen. And in Jim Raffman is not going to be with us tonight. Uh, we just got off the phone with him and he, he certainly will be abreast of everything that's going on. And Jim and I have been working on some things since you, well, actually every day. And we will get into that later on. But today I want to introduce y'all to these family members, and then we're going to talk about some certain aspects of the case that we just need to get out of the way. We need to put it to bed, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. And But I, I want to thank each and every one of you. you your response has been overwhelming. It, uh, it's, it's awesome. Y'all, we, we started the, the email, uh, the tip line email, and I forgot to tell you all this, but I've already gotten people that are sending stuff in. And the... The email is who murdered Courtney at gmail.com. And we're going to post it in the show notes and you'll have it. Uh, and it's important y'all No, no, the only silly idea is the deal that idea that you don't come forward with. Right. And 
So we need you. And I didn't know this was called crowdsourcing. Someone uh, told me about that uh, today. Another lifer did or not today, yesterday. And so crowdsourcing is when you use the fans to help solve cases. And y'all, we're going to crowdsource the heck out of this. We need you. And somebody out there knows what happened. And somebody out there um, can come up with an idea uh, to help us break this case. So the keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. Patron members. It's huge. Yeah, y'all, you know, we had a huge response from y'all this week and everybody wants to help in, in Courtney's case and we couldn't do it without you. Um, that being said, the close page where, where for vandalism tears and up where the information is being put out um, on there. This week, the information, I'll, I'll tell you about it at the end of the show, but it's going to be some pretty important stuff, including uh, toxicology reports, uh, autopsy reports, stuff like that. And I put very strict rules in place, y'all. You, you, you know it if you're a member of that page. If, if you violate these rules, you'll be, you will be done with you. Okay. We have to respect the, the privacy of the family and we don't want the wrong people to get a heads up that we're coming for them. Okay. And, and also from this point forward, we're talking about Courtney's case. We're going to have people that are people of interest, um, that we're going to look at. Everybody is going to be looked at until we, you know, can exclude them. And we're no longer going to use any names, uh, but it's not really going to apply today, y'all. But we're not going to use any names on people of interest. We're going to come up with some type of code system, and we'll tell you about that next week. But without further ado, I'm going to tell you um, Miss Stephanie is here. Miss Stephanie? Hello. So, um, y'all, Miss Stephanie is Courtney's mom. Um, and if you listened to the episode last week, you'll, you'll recognize the voice, right? So uh, you're doing okay. I'm doing fine. All right. So we have all your family here, right? Yes, and sir. and um, I didn't know y'all that. What it just? I mean, Steph, Stephanie and I sat down last week and, and talked for uh, a long time, and and but I didn't know at that time what important part the other members of her family have played in Courtney's case. And now, what I'm I'm going to describe to you what I'm looking at now. Besides these beautiful ladies, uh, I'm looking at a table stacked full of information of 15 years of casework that this family has put together. And, uh, it's, it's impressive and to say the least. And, and so they know what they're doing. They have lived this. Miss Stephanie has not been alone. These family members have lived this. They cried it. They've hurt with it and they still do every day. And that's why we're doing this, Miss Stephanie. And um, so I'm going to introduce everybody else. Miss Lynn, go ahead. Um, I'm Lynn, and I'm Stephanie's um, sister that's 11 months younger than her. And um, I'm Courtney's aunt. She called me Nanan. And, um, and I'm just really happy to be here and to be part of this. And uh, this is the only thing... I can do for her at this point um, beside, um, you know, on the special dates that come by where we try to comfort Stephanie and be there for Stephanie. We are also hurting in our own little corner, um, but we want to do this for Courtney. We want to be her voice. And, and Miss Lynn, you, you, you have a, this is your daughter that's so close in age uh, yes. to Courtney. Um, my daughter, Candace and Courtney were four months apart. They were baptized on the same day. They made their first Holy Communion together. They actually graduated on the same night, and um, and they were very close. They were both cheerleaders, and, um, and so my daughter Candace is very, very close with her, along with my other niece, Kayla, who has been very, very close with her, too. And, and see, so y'all can't see what I'm seeing, and... Every time Lynn is saying something, all the heads at the table are nodding and there's, they're whispering yes. I, got, I guess they're afraid of the voice on the microphone. Very, very strong family unit here. Um, you know, I know it's not easy, but there's a reason we're here. 
Go. Okay, my name is Michelle. I'm Stephanie's baby sister, and Courtney was my godchild. She called me Shell, and um, my daughter is Kayla, that Lynn was referring to, and she was two years younger than Candace and Courtney, and so they kind of babied her, but still let her hang out with them because they all did cheerleading and gymnastics together. And Kayla always said, Courtney may have only been 110 pounds, but she was a firecracker if anybody tried to mess with uh, Kayla. Courtney oh, always yeah. had her back. Took care of her. Yeah, Took care of her. Take care of her, Kayla. Yeah. So really, the cousins and, and oh, all that. Tight yes. So you, three girls. We all you, took of them. you are Courtney's godmother and Lynn, your husband. I, I'm looking at yeah, the three picture girls. of them. That's them. Yeah. Can, can I get a copy of this? Courtney, Sissy, and Kayla. Beautiful, Sissy. beautiful yeah. girls. So you're her godmother, and Lynn, your husband, is God. her godfather. Yes. And y'all, you know, if you're not Catholic or whatever, you know, that's that's really uh, yeah. the ultimate sign of, of respect. You know, you, you actually, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong about this, if, you know, if something that had happened to Stephanie – and her husband and Courtney needed to be cared for. The, actually, the, it's godmother and godfather's responsibility to make sure they're raised the right way, et cetera. It's a very important position um, and, and a sign of respect, right? So, yes. We would have taken her and raised her rights. Yeah, yeah. And we next is um, Courtney's grandmother. I'm going to let her introduce herself. My name is Angela Board. Excuse me, my voice is quivering. It's okay. Listen, y'all, it's okay to cry and get upset. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, 15 years and it's your baby, right? And it's hard because I look over at Stephanie. I see her pain. I listen to Lynn talk about her and her pain. And my baby girl, Michelle, and her pain. And then I think about Bobby. Uh, Stephanie's husband, who was actually the only father figure in Courtney's life. Bobby never had children, so Courtney was like his. After her daddy died, then Bobby was like the sole daddy there. But Courtney's dad did die at a very young age. She was only eight when her dad died. But Bobby was a part, big part of her life because he helped teach her how to walk and everything. But anyway, um, Courtney called me my mom. And that's what all my grandchildren call me, my mom. And Lace, Stephanie's oldest child, is the one that spells it the way it's spelled, M-U-M-U, like a moo-moo. But, <laughs> but she would say my mom. So I have kept it that way since uh, Stephanie's oldest daughter named me that. She was the oldest, so I let them call me whatever she wanted. And uh, that's her name for me. So all of my grandkids, to me, are called my baby boys and baby girls. I, I, I had eight grandchildren. I got seven living. And they're all my baby boys, baby girls. And my great-grandchildren I refer to as my baby boys and baby girls. And um, this has been a very tough, tough, tough ride. And as as the mother of Stephanie, I can honestly tell all of you that right after Courtney died, Stephanie did not want to live. She really didn't want to live. And she would look to me. She wouldn't let me out of her sight. I, wouldn't, I couldn't get two steps from her. And she needed to have her mama. And, and I... Um, I tried to give her as much strength and courage as I could, and I never let her see me cry. I never did. When she was crying and hurting, I was always there to be strong for her. But then when I got a chance to get away from her for a few minutes, I would sob. One day, right after Courtney was murdered, there were hundreds of people at Stephanie's house. And, uh, and y'all, I lovingly have called her Taffy since she was three hours old. But 
her name is Stephanie, and she reminds me of that, but she loves the name Taffy, too. But uh, I walked out of her house, and there were, like I said, hundreds of people everywhere and uh, that were hearing that Courtney's body had just been identified. And uh, when I walked out of the house, Stephanie looked at me, and she said, Mom, I don't know how to pray. And she really could not pray. So she forgot words to the Our Father. So I knelt in front of her, grabbed her hands, and said, you know what? The devil is a liar. We're going to pray. And I held her hands, and we began to pray. And it took some nudging because, honestly, I don't even know if Stephanie was even aware of her surroundings at that point. And um, the minute she found out that Courtney's body was actually the body that was in Beaumont, she fainted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I immediately hollered to a friend of mine. I know Steph got it a little bit different when she had made her story, but my... Um, a friend of mine, is a nurse, she was there and I hollered for her. And I got on the floor right next to Stephanie's head and I kept saying, you have to come back to mama. You have to. And she would not respond. And then finally she uttered real softly, mom, mom, real, you could barely hear it. And I'm like, you have to come back to mama. And she said, mom. I'm not as strong as you are. And I said, yes, you are. And you have got to come back to Mama. So, she... she, Remember, she started screaming, I don't want to live, I want to die. Just let me die, I don't want to live without my child. She she did not want to live. She really did. She also said, even Lazarus brought back, even Lazarus was brought back by the Lord in three days, and so God can bring back to me. And I'm actually the one that had to deliver her the blow and use, yeah. which was the worst. Yeah. Was, my husband went down to identify the body um, because he was in law enforcement and he went down to the crime scene. And I remember she was sitting across the table from me and um, we were waiting for the call with all hope, with all hope in our heart that there had to be a mistake, that it had to be somebody else, that somebody else just had Courtney's ring on it. It wasn't really her. And when my husband called and he said, it's her, I couldn't even say anything. I just looked at her and I, I was like, I'm fixing to give my sister the worst news of her life. God help me, give me the strength. And I had to tell her, Stephanie, I think that's it's her. her. You did. And, and um, it's the most horrible thing thing that I've ever had to do is to tell her to take every ounce of hope from her by telling her it was Courtney and we had to start planning a funeral. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. And just to back it up that very day um, at 12 o'clock I was watching the 12 o'clock news and I was watching um at the time, the serial killer, Derek Toddley, Derek Toddley from, from, yeah. from Derek Baton Rouge. Right. And I was watching on the news, all of his family gathered outside and they were, you know, they were getting ready to go inside. And I was praying so hard for those people. And I was like, oh my gosh, like the horrendous thing these people were fixing to go through. And my phone rang at 12.15. And all I heard Stephanie say was, I know I didn't body Courtney ring. That was all I heard, and I just I said I'm coming. I didn't know where I was going, but I said I'm coming, and um, I contacted Michelle to please, please head Mom straight Daddy. over to my mom and daddy's house and to please pick them up. Uh, something awful. We didn't know. And she I didn't mean, know. She couldn't even tell me. Mm-hmm. We we didn't know. We just knew we had to be with her. I remember calling Bobby. And I remember calling Lace. That's the only two people I remember and calling. Had, and I don't even know how I remember that. You had years. been on speed dial, and whatever God let you press the right number, and all she could hear was Courtney body. Yeah, you were hysterical. Courtney body. <clears throat> and Lynn just hung up on you at that time, Taffy. 
and called Shell and told her to come get me and Daddy right away. And so we all beat uh, the detective that called you to, we, we beat him to your house, and we lived further out from, than, than he did. And um, he was right there at the police station in Ellie, and we were out on 28 East, you know that. And we beat him there. I guess because Michelle is a known fast driver. Yes. Um, anyway, we got there, and honestly, Taffy, Bobby, Bobby, you got there first. They didn't. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I want to introduce Mr. Bobby. Is in the room. It's Courtney's. I wouldn't even say stepdad. Courtney's dad passed, and he he raised her. And I, Mr. Bobby, I saw some pictures of uh, y'all on a motorcycle. A picture of you and and, and Courtney. So and I get that I have I, I have babies that I've raised that are my step babies, but I don't call them that either. So and uh, Mr. Bobby is in the room also, y'all. And and uh, I'm uh, Robert Bell boys just called me Bobby. I uh, was her stepdad for eighteen and a half years. And, and in case y'all, we have I have two mics set up, and you know I'm not technical, but um. This, Miss, he said his name is Mr. Robert Belgard, and it was Courtney's stepdad or dad for 18 and a half years. And so a lot of pain in this room, uh, uh, a lot of faith in this room. And, you know, there's, there's a reason we're together and we're going to try to push forward to we have to, to close to to do something with this, right? I don't believe in closure. I just believe that God is going to help us through this all. But we'll never, we will never, ever, never, ever, ever never forget. Bring her back. No. And, but and not, but I, I have one little story to share, and I've tried to share this with a lot of people. Right after Courtney died, uh, was murdered actually. But I hate to say that word, but it's fact. I um this friend of mine that had was at my house at Taffy's house with me the day that we got the news that Courtney was in fact uh, identified and Greg had gone there with two officers from APD and um my friend when I would tell my friend that I could not stand the pain anymore not about Courtney being murdered I couldn't and she kept telling me, Ina, you can do this. <clears throat> and I am a very strong-willed person. But, you know, there comes a time when you see everybody around you crumbling down and you, you try to figure a way to hold everybody up. She shared with me that, that God could take away all of my pain, but the first thing he'd have to do is take away my memories. And I wasn't willing to forego that, so I just decided that I was going to just go through whatever I had to go through, me and my little family, and we were going to make it to the end. That's powerful, right? The, um, so uh, maybe it's not like I said, it's, you never get, get closure, but maybe we get to the point where we quit wondering uh, who and what happened and then you can focus on the memories. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble Meal Kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef Boom, Jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, siapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something. All the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real we've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box 
right to my door. So see what a difference GABA will make for your household. Right now, they're offering my listeners a fantastic limited time deal. You get $120 off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G O B B L E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you've never had. Hey, ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is... You don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have Hormone Harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone Harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says... It makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. Right. So one more thing, I, Ms. Anna, I, I want to talk to you about real quick. Uh, Stephanie gave me some photographs from um, Courtney's funeral that had little verses on it. And and the, uh, they are on the, um, the private patron page, y'all. And, but the verses, you would think, I mean, me not knowing, right? I would think you're, just, you're going to a funeral home and it's, it's a awake and they put a pretty picture of the girl and a, and a, a Bible verse, but that's not what happened in this case. And I, I want to tell this because I think it's important. Can you tell us, uh, and the time frame is important, not, not from a criminal standpoint, but just from a, a, a an emotional, real, real, uh, good one. I, I had been, uh, this is my mind again. I had been at uh, Angola for a couple of days. I, I'm their union rep. Yeah, you, you, were, you were working. You weren't a resident, right? I wasn't a resident of Angola. I, I, I was actually working. And then I came home, and it was the afternoon of the 30th, uh, September 30th, and I got a call from Courtney. And... Uh, it, it, we're like, you know, our first look, hey, BB, how are you? Hey, mama. And so, um, anyway, I had given to each one of my children and grandchildren, I'd go and deliver the Purpose Driven Life book. I brought that, a notepad, and a little work study book with it. And I said, okay, everybody, I mean, everybody, my kids, my grandkids, all got one of those books with a little study pamphlet, and I assured them that they could not discuss any of this. They had to read one chapter at a time and jot down their little questions, and then we would get ourselves back together and discuss it. So when I got home that day on the 30th, and Courtney called me, she said, Mama, I want to talk to you about Chapter 6 of the book and I said oh my god baby mama didn't get a chance to read it because I'd been working and she said it was cute though mama and you asked us to read one chapter every day and then discuss it I said 
My mother's going to have to beg your forgiveness. I'm going to read it, though. She said, okay. And remember, chapter 6 is my favorite chapter so far. So after we were sitting around God trying to plan Courtney's funeral, um, I remembered, you know, you start trying to remember the last time you talked to someone or saw them, and all of a sudden I could hear her voice saying, Mama, remember chapter 6 is my favorite chapter. And so I asked Daffy or Shell or Lynn, I don't know, one of them to get me the book quick that I had to see um, what was what that chapter was. And this is just a part of it. It says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me my days are numbered and my life is fleeing away. And that's Psalms 39, verse 4. And uh, this last little part is, I am here on earth for just a little while. And that's Psalm 119. Now, we use that as part of Courtney's little obituary thing that they give out at the funeral homes and stuff. And I had told that story on TV because I have very close friends that work for Channel 5. And um, they wanted me to come by the TV station before I went to the funeral home because they wanted for me to talk about Courtney, my grandbaby. And um, they met me at the front door when I got there, all the reporters. And so I began to tell them the story about the book. And um, I had so many of my friends that did come to the funeral home later tell me they had seen that. Um, and, and they asked me so much about Courtney. Tell us what she was like. And I told them that she talked too fast. And that I sometimes would tell her, slow down so my mom can understand. And then I shared so many other things with them about my baby girl. But um, she was a joy. And I loved her. I know. It's obvious, y'all, how much you all love her. But the it's okay. The, not a dry in the room. But the, um, I just thought it was amazing that she, she told you that on September 30th, and she was murdered just a couple of days later. Okay, but anyway, y'all, the um, like I said, it's unscripted and, and everything. But the you met the family, or not all of them naturally, but you met the the ladies and the gentlemen who've been working this case or living this nightmare for 15 years now. I'm going to talk about the reason I believe they've been living it for 15 years and it's not been closed. Okay. Now I'm, I don't even know how to really begin it other than to say, I mean, I'm straight up. I'm going to be talking about the police work or, or lack thereof. And what happened, if you listen last week is, uh the detective Cedric Green from Alexandria Police Department called Stephanie on the phone and basically told her that Courtney was dead, didn't do it in person. And then at some point later on, he came to the house, et cetera. And Stephanie said that it, she never felt like he treated her uh, right, or if she felt like he treated her as a suspect, et cetera. And, and other family members have told me the same thing. Everybody here is shaking their head. But at some point, Stephanie and, and the, they went to the sheriff and, and asked for help on the case. Now, let me explain to you, and most people don't know this, the sheriff is the highest ranking law enforcement official in a parish. They have the ultimate say so when it cl comes to claiming jurisdiction over any type of case. And one of the things most people don't know, and I didn't know this until uh, <laughs> it actually happened. The sheriff can actually tell the state police to get out of the parish. And um, 
the so that's that's how much power they have. But so Stephanie and they went to the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office and the sheriff. You want to tell me what happened? Well, Sheriff Hilton, who is our present sheriff, I had asked him right before that election because we everywhere we turned with APD, we hit a brick wall. So I guess out of desperation, uh, a friend was running for sheriff, and I thought, you know, I'm going to sit down and give him some information and see if he can help me if he gets elected because he had been our sheriff before. And uh, so then we met for lunch. I gave him a folder with information about Courtney's case, and um, he called me the next day, and he said, I wonder why no one has been arrested. I said, I don't know. And he said, well, when I become sheriff, Anna, I promise you that I'm going to assign my two best detectives to that case. And I thanked him, and I, I was so full of hope because I felt like maybe someone was going to listen to us. And um, may I ask some sign of the, what year was that? The, the well, I guess I guess the sheriff's election is every four years, so that would have been two thousand six. I was going to say two thousand six, so early, but maybe it was two thousand and eight. Well, it was the sheriff when Courtney died. No, he was he got elected sheriff when after Courtney died. That they, they were matter of fact, the election was November, and we had we had another sheriff then, but William Earl won that race. William Earl Hilton, right. he won that race, so he took the reins over in. Uh, they swear in in like July one. So okay, so that's okay. That's okay. I'm not trying to trick you up. I just there's a reason. I'm, it's okay. It's it's okay. The the y'all. There's a reason I'm telling you about this. All right. Now, this this is a fact. There was a, a Courtney death certificate, and it going to lock it up on the patron page uh, along with the autopsy report and toxicology, et cetera, which we're about to talk about. The it states this case is a homicide. Courtney was murdered. A homicide is an illegal taking of a life. And it, but the case is in Chambers County, Texas. That's the jurisdiction. This, uh, the, it happened in Winnie, Texas. Uh, there was the detective Rabelais. What, yeah, what was his first name? David, David Rabelais, who, uh, the, the family members all, are very fond of he's now retired on medical retirement but he said he went above and beyond and working he said he'll never forget about this case and you know what that's how it should be and, and that's how i've worked every, every case i ever worked like that right and, and that's how i'm going to work courtney's case but then let me back up to that the detective rabelais came to alexandria now the reason why that's we know Courtney was last seen at her residence that she was renting uh, in Alexandria. We know they had a party there, a Domino's party, et cetera, the night she was murdered or went missing, which what have you. So it's probable that, and there's some other issues that go into the, the reason. So they're looking at some people up here, people of interest up here. But Detective Rabelais comes up and he gets shut down and we're going to talk about that for a second and then i'll tell you how ludicrous that is who, who wants to tell me he he came over to my house um, detective, rabelais. detective rabelais and um he you know had courtney's file with him and everything and uh he sat at the table and asked us a lot of questions and everything but he also had been talking to the APD detectives. APD is Alexandria. Police, police Department, yes, sir. And um, he told us, me and my husband were there. Do you remember exactly how he said it? He said that uh, he was a 17-year 20, detective in Beaumont. He averaged four homicides a week 
He's worked with other agencies, police agencies, nationally and abroad, and he's never had a police department lie to him and not cooperate until he met APD. Okay, y'all say, Mr. Bobby just told you, the Detective Ravelais, uh, how many homicides, Mr. Bobby? I, I, maybe, I'm only saying it because of them. maybe I can hear you. Right. Four a week for 17 years. And, and so you have a very experienced investigator who is, who obviously loves what he does. Cause I'm going to tell you something. If you stay in homicide that long without burning out, that's a credit to you right there. And I, I can tell you about that myself, but he's here and he's getting shut down. Okay. Now the, I, even when I was with the state police and I would go out to assist other agencies on their cases, the first thing you do is out of respect, you show up in the jurisdiction, you go to the, whatever law enforcement agency it is, tell them who you are. Naturally, they already knew who he was, right? That, um, Cedric Green and them did, but they, he said they absolutely lied to him, uh, shut him down. And what else, Mr. Bobby? And, and, and I'm, I'm repeating this, y'all, because I don't know if this other mic is picking it up. And Mr. Bobby said that Detective Rabelais said he requested to go interview suspects, not people of interest, but suspects in Courtney's murder. And they told him no. This was their turf. They wanted to know what that detective was doing here on their turf. Uh, yes, and uh, well, someone from the sheriff's office must have said that to him because he had gone there. I mean, you know, he's a brother officer. He came from the sheriff's department in Chambers County, and so he came and met with the people uh, at the sheriff's office, and then uh, that's when uh, they got word that uh, they didn't know what he was doing on their turf. I did address that with Chief Kuti. I said, I didn't know this was a turf war. I thought we were trying to work with people to solve Courtney's murder. And um, we, we, we pushed back on that. But I can honestly tell you that Detective Rabelais, as far as I'm concerned, was, is one of the most compassionate. And he tried so very hard to get the information he needed to solve my grandbaby's crime. And he was denied that. Yeah. Okay, so she mentioned Kuti. That was the chief, chief of the APD. Right. Okay, and and at the right. So, yeah, y'all, this is not speculation. This is fact that is told to them by Detective Rabelais himself. Now, I can tell you, and from assisting other agencies, whether it's towns or cities, et cetera. Yeah, you know, everybody knows about the blue wall, right? The brotherhood of law enforcement. And why would you shut somebody down and say, what are you doing here on our turf, et cetera? First of all, the, the death certificate is signed out of Chambers County, Texas. Detective Rabelais is assigned to work this homicide, homicide. And he comes up here and they just, they, they cut him off. My question is why? Okay. So we're going to get more into this as this investigation goes on. Um, but it just, it's not right. And, and let, let me fast forward just a little bit. He told us he had never been treated so unprofessionally ever in his life, in all of his work, but never. There were jurisdiction issues from the very beginning, and all the, the articles that came out of Texas, um, there was, later, yeah, there, they later. always was mentioning jurisdiction issues. Okay, all right, so we'll get more into it, y'all, later on, but this is going to segue into the next part, the um, which is, at some point, the family goes 
like uh, you heard, um, the grandmother state, they, they get the, sh- the sheriff, the newly elected sheriff, and they, he puts his two best guys on it. And it goes on, uh, obviously, like I told y'all earlier, this big long table I'm looking at with all these, this case file information, all these work these ladies and this gentleman have done for Courtney, uh, time lapse. It's just, you couldn't believe what I'm looking at, right? So they, they give all of this to, uh, Detective Isles. And how do you spell that? I-S-L-E-S. I-S-L-E-S. So I don't say it incorrectly. Detective Isles with the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office, who is assigned to Courtney's case. Now, with the, I'm, the uh, last week when I was talking with Stephanie, she had, uh, he, she had called the day before and some days before that trying to get Courtney's class ring, which is what they used to identify our body and trying to get, uh, a, an update on what's going on, on on the case. And she got the runaround basically. Uh, um, and nobody would call her back. And it, actually I think it was a week and a half. You started with the calls, but while I was there, she, uh, had told me about talking to him again the day before. And I said, well, you know what? Why don't you call them now? Let's, let's see what they have to say. And Miss Stephanie actually recorded this phone conversation. And I want you to listen to it. I'm going to play it. It's, it's off a recorder that she had. And, and I'm going to play it. The audio may not be the best, but this is Miss Stephanie talking to Detective Isles about Courtney's case and where they are. And just, I mean, it's really something. And then we're going to talk about it when we get done. So y'all bear with me one second. Turn the volume up. And this will be the first time y'all have heard this. But, um, <coughs> And you're going to hear me talking to uh, Stephanie while she's on the phone with him at some points because I have questions why, what, about things that the text I was saying. And I'm actually hitting Stephanie's mute button and saying, hey, what about this? What about this? So, th- again, y'all, this is unedited. So here it is. Hey, man, I want whatever I can get out of my daughter's case file. He says, why? Well, I said, because I want it. Well, I just talked to him. Yeah. So you're talking about Mims? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Phillips. Okay, let me call him back. Because they told me he was in That's a... Right. Right. So you're supposed to call back yesterday. This is the last number I got, so here it is. Yeah, I, so I, want it. I want everything that's not classified. Not classified. I think he says it's classified. There he is. Has he been in tomorrow? Colonel Records, can I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. Is Detective Phillips um, out of his meeting yet? Yeah, I'm pausing for one second. They had told uh, you didn't know it was Phillips and Isles were on the case. And, and Mims, right. That. There was two people that they told me detectives that I would have to talk to about getting Courtney's ring, and I didn't. I didn't know who these people were. They mentioned a Mims and a Phillips or Phelps or something, and so um, I kept trying over and over to call them and I never could get them to call me back so then I eventually I just I said is this the same uh, office that Detective Isles is in and they said yes and I said well then is he here okay this is Stephanie Belgard Uh, could you check for me please well, I mean, I can't check. I can send you to him. We don't work in the same office. Okay. Well, could you get me over? Okay. Yeah, I'll transfer you to him. Okay. Just a second. Okay. And thank I you. guess if he doesn't answer, then that just means he's not in there, and you just have to, you know, call back. Okay. What about Let's Detective Oz? It's what about Detective Oz? Is he in the same office also? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because um, I can tell if they're in their office. I can just give you their number. 
Let me give you Philip's oh. number. That way, if you have to call back, it'll go directly to him. Yes, ma'am. I'd appreciate that. I'm ready. Okay, it's 473 6712. Wait, 4736 two. Uh, 6712. Oh, 6712. Okay. Okay, and that's directly and to I'll Yeah, I'll transfer you, but if you have to call back, you can call him directly at that number. Okay, and Mr. Alls, would he be reached at that same number also? No, his would be 473 Again, y'all, any whispering you hear us, Stephanie and I talking while we're waiting on the phone call to pick up. Again, it's unedited, unscripted. You're you're hearing it as it happened, y'all. So hold on. You can hear Stephanie and I talking in the background while we're waiting on them to pick up the phone. Hey y'all, again, we we'll apologize for the delay, but it's unedited, unscripted. That um, You're getting it just like Stephanie recorded it. Believe me, it's important. You're going to want to hear it. What it, how do you spell it? I L E S is Detective I L E S. Well, I guess we might could edit this part out, right? So I didn't, I didn't remember it taking this long. Yeah, we just that's right because we were talking. You're right. Seems like somebody would have picked back up by now. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was holding for Detective Phillips. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, back. Oh. Oh, there you go. It's your ta- tax dollars at work. Oh. Stephanie Bellgard again. I had talked to you earlier. Um, did, did, uh, 
do you know when you may be able to um, go, get me that case ID number? Or, or? I, I, I don't have a number yet, but I checked with the uh, property guys, and we don't have any kids around here, so we don't have any property regarding the case. That would be all with APD or state police. Okay, well, the APD told me they gave y'all everything. So, I, okay, so I guess I need to start back with them because Detective Isles is on this case and I... Yeah, I, I just spoke with Detective Isles and he said that we don't have any uh, physical evidence at all. We don't have any property regarding this case. Okay, well, the, I just... Is is Detective Isles in where I could talk to him and... Well, he's had too much. Let me check. Hold on. Okay. That is Stephanie and I whispering in the background, y'all, waiting on Detective Isles to get on the phone. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered... A super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser-cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's-eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh-cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. And calming like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., They have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Why choose a Sleep Number Smart Bed? Can I make my side softer? Can I make my side firmer? Can Can we we sleep sleep cooler? Sleep Number does that. Cools up to eight times faster and lets you choose your ideal comfort on either side. Your Sleep Number setting. And now, during our Veterans Day sale, save 40% on the Sleep Number Special Edition Smart Bed, plus free home delivery with any base. Ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. you um you know our 15 year mark is coming up and um i'm just wanting to know what the status of courtney's case is okay um the status is the same it is it's still open um i, I would say that I, I, I we followed up on every lead that's coming up there and um you have um everything that that um i have um and it's still an open case Ms. Belgar. okay um i had um talked to uh mr mims and i uh, had asked him about maybe getting courtney's ring 
And okay. um, so he said he's got to go to the warehouse and get that for me. And also okay. he was going to get me a case ID. I don't even have a case ID on Courtney's case. But um, um, I, I, I really would like to get her graduation ring. I mean, y'all y'all used okay. it for... And he also told me something that was a little well, bit baffling to me. Let, me. let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. Okay. We do not have any property from that case. Okay. Okay. We start when we started this. This was just started um, from the open end. Well, when you came to us, we came to sheriff to help out. APD still has all of that. Um, our um, the Texas has all of that. We don't have any of Courtney's property. Texas has nothing of Courtney's, and Mr. Isles, I have a copy of the when we turned in her phone. Um, okay. we brought it to Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office and, um, or maybe it was APD that has the cop, has her phone, her actual phone, and yes, what, the items that were taken from her house, I mean, how can they do testing on them or DNA or anything on them if y'all don't even have them? I mean, I don't understand how... Y'all can work an investigation when there's y'all don't have anything other than the leads that we gave y'all. Okay, because that's all I could have to go on because they're not they won't release any of the property to me. It's an Alexandria Police Department case. Um, they won't give me any of the physical property. What I had to go on was starting off was actually this the. Um, information that you came to me to my office mm -hmm. and then we started from there looking backwards and but we did not collect any evidence from the Alexander Police Department um, in reference to this case. None of the physical evidence. Okay, so you're telling me that Alexander Police Department has all of I mean they have her case, they're working it? Or they just Man, have her I stuff. Mean, never, we never took it. We never took the case from them. Okay. Well, Mr. Alls, I thought you were the lead detective on Courtney's case. I am the lead detective with the Rapid Superior Sheriff's Office because you came to the sheriff and asked for us to assist in it. Yes, sir. Now, um, we don't, I don't have authority to take it from the Alexander Police Department. Um, they still had the original case file. They still had all the original property from the case. I started from scratch with the no show guy and started working it from our angle. But okay. they never, they, I've never taken it from them. Okay, well, do I need to talk to the chief about that? Or, I mean, who do I need to talk to? Okay. Jerry King? Um, I would talk to Jerry King about any property that you have that APD may still have. Well, they ha I have a whole list of things that they took from Courtney's okay. house. Yes, ma'am. And APD still has that. We okay. don't have any of it. Okay. 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 Um, also, second question. Um, that that toxicology report that you um, that uh, Stephen Norman did. Um, did you I ever didn't actually do the? Um, that was the actual toxicology is done was done by Texas. Okay. Well, the it, report itself. Yes, sir. Was actually um, as far as was an opinion by Dr. Norman. Okay. His but opinion. The toxicology is done was and the results of the toxicology with the stuff in the system. Yes. Was done by Texas. Okay, because um, I just you know I told you I didn't buy it and I wasn't. I, I, that just wasn't satisfying to me, but um, I just, I'm, I'm just kind of um, really confused on why would they even do a second toxicology report when there was, I mean, there was no, ne there was never any mention from any, anybody that gave us tips or anything. Nobody ever we said Courtney was drunk. We called, I, I, I can explain that to you um, directly. Um, Miss Stephanie, is that I called over there to Texas and said, okay, um, what do you, you know, uh, since, was there anything still over there that y'all had? 
or anything else. And Texas um, looked at it and says, okay, we still have her blood. Uh, we still have some of her blood. And I said, okay, can we rework that um, to make sure that, it, that we didn't miss nothing with either today's technology or, you know, what we have? Can we just rerun it and, and redo everything? So they took the blood and redid another did a rework up, and that's when the results of that came up. Why that didn't show up on the first one? Yes, sir. Um, it, it may be um, just, it, it may be clerical error on that. I, 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 I didn't believe I can't tell you the difference why the first one said that what it did and why the second one said no, this is what it, this is what this did. Okay. Because, Mr. Alls, um, I, I know you, there was french fries in her stomach. And if she would have drank that much alcohol and took that much pills or whatever, that she would have thrown up and there wouldn't have been anything in her okay. stomach. And I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, I but I can figure that yeah, out. Yeah, ma'am, but, but, you know, I, 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 would, I would be cautious about saying what you think she should have done or, or what should have happened. Okay, as far as maybe she should have thrown up or she shouldn't have thrown up, you know, because then we're getting back into the guessing game. Okay. And, you know, I don't I understand what you're trying to say. Okay? okay. But I can't take that. We can't take that as 100% possible that she should have thrown up or she should have not done this. Okay. Well, let me just ask you this. Um, you had said that y'all uh, had called Texas and asked about, um, you know, anything they might have had. Do they still have her, Her, I mean, is that blood, is that her DNA? I mean, the DNA that they put into the CODA system is, what was that, blood? Be because now they have a, a familial uh, DNA blood test that you can do, and it it's a new technology, and you can do, and it will, you know, hook you up to, like, cousins or brothers or an uncle or... You know, okay. so, so I mean, if y'all went through the, the task of testing her blood, why not redo her DNA and, and test that and see if it any more match, you know, a match or anything? Okay. You're talking about the DNA that was left at the scene? Yes, sir. Um, um, as far as, okay, not her, not, I don't, not her blood, because, I mean, we know her blood is, came from her. You know, that's not going to show anything, but you're talking about the DNA that, uh, that that was collected. Yes, well, um, where they sent it to the, the lab, where they got inconclusive facts. Yes. Right. Okay. Because there was okay. D, the only DNA they had was DNA that was mixed with Courtney's blood. Mm -hmm. It was mixed, so it it was both DNAs. Okay. On the on the trunk lab, what uh, I was told. That was from the uh, original um, crime lab reports. Yes, Let me sir. check on see if that was either Texas or us, and um, we can look into the from doing that. The familial what DNA. We come up with, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, I'm I'm just um you know I I, I start getting this um just. It was on the trunk latch. It was. It was on the, the DNA that was on the trunk latch. That's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Because it had to, somebody, if it was mixed with Courtney's, then they had to be present there at that time. So, okay. um, Well, I mean, again, I mean, that's, you're, you're doing an assumption. I don't, sir, that's, that's all I have to go on. I know that. I'm just saying that. I'm just saying that you, when you're saying that they have to be there together at the same time. And yes, technically, sir. no, that's, that's not the case. Okay. Can DNA get mixed for one people person leaving it there and then somebody coming afterwards with the subject not there and mixing it? It is possible. Okay. Um, because but then, you know, um, but we, we can definitely look into the, you know, at the DNA again. See what we can come up with because we're actually having some success on some other cold cases in reference to that type of yes, sir. Um, DNA profile. Okay, because um, I know the... Um, the second blood test that y'all did, what what year did y'all do that in? Uh, um, I gotta go back and look, but it's right there within 
um, with today's new technology is if we can't pull something else up. Yes, sir. Well, um, so so if y'all don't even have the profile on the DNA, then how do how was any of the items taken from her house, like the Coke cans, cigarette butts, beer cans, uh, dominoes? The, the how could it, how could y'all match up anything DNA off any of that stuff with with the DNA that y'all have? If y'all have don't even know a profile on it. Okay. We haven't matched the DNA, any of the D D DNA profile or anything that was collected um, with anyone. So all these people that were there at her house must have been choir people or something okay. because none of them's ever been in any kind of trouble. You're asking me about a crime scene, ma'am, that was done 13 years before I started even on the case. Yes, sir, but the, you're in charge now, Mr. Isles. Who else am I going to talk to? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to get off the phone with you, Miss Stephanie. All I'm saying is APD has not given me anything. Well, I'm going to take care of that today. They have. Okay, and they're still, I'm sure, actively, you know, but even the reports I got from APD, of APD, I got from Texas. They're not actively not working me. anything, Mr. Oz. I feel like nobody is actively working anything. Nobody. Okay. Um, Ma'am, I've, I've followed up every lead that y'all sent my way or that I found out. Um, I'm glad you called so we can uh, look at the D yeah. DNA again. Yeah. But to tell you why the blood did not show any drugs uh -huh. with a 13 years difference, uh -huh. I can't answer that question. When I asked her lab that, they couldn't answer it either. Okay, well, I just know that, um, I, I, one, one way, one way screwed up. Yeah, something, something's not right. And they were pretty positive that it wasn't the, the, the current way. Uh-huh. So, I, I, I just, I've, I've researched a lot of, lot of things, and, and I've never known where they've, retested someone's toxicology report from the initial one. Okay. Okay, well, um, I'm, what, I, what I think I'm going to do, Detective Isles, is I'm going to take this, this investigation into my own hands and see if I can get somebody that will actively work her case. Because I feel like nothing is being done. Um, every time I call, you're in training or you're there. And, and now you're telling me you don't even have Courtney's stuff, the, the stuff that they took from her house. and. Ma'am, and, I've never had that stuff. I've never told well, you I've had that stuff. No, sir, but why wouldn't you not have that if you're her lead detective? Ma'am, you came to the sheriff want him to look into it. And the sheriff says, okay, we will look into it. So I can go down to me to work the case. But that does not give me any legal authority to take it away from the Alexander Police Department. So when we contacted Ellen for even, even the case files, okay, it, they did not cooperate as far as giving us anything. Okay. It so, was an, it was an, you know, so we started from the very beginning, from your notes, we went over to Texas, we followed up every lead that we could, we scrapped together anything that we could have, and we began working it from a 13-year disadvantage, but yes. we did not get any of her property. The reports I do have from Alexander Police Department, I got from Texas. Okay. Well, I know that they, from day one, never cooperated with Texas other than to go down there and identify her body. And, and pretty much, you know, I had a detective that was coming from Texas, and he said he had never been, um, uh, in his 27 years of police work, had never been turned down by a police agency before in his life other than APD. And so I just, okay. you know, so now you're telling me they're I'll still... I'll with that guy. Okay. Th yes. And uh, so if I get any information now, or if I needed to, to to send anyone to get information on Courtney's case, you're telling me I need to send them to Alexander Police Department. 
Ma'am, I'm act am I actively working the case? Yes. I'm just saying that I'm not I'm not the sole person who can take okay. away from the Alexander Police Department. And I'm not saying Alexander wouldn't follow up on a new lead. I'm not trying to you know paint A P D in a in a bad light to you. Okay. Um, I don't know who's actively working, if anyone. Last time I heard it was folks she was working at through the Alexander Police Department. Oh she he hasn't been on this case in years. I haven't even talked to this man in years. Uh, David, David Foshi. David Foshi. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, uh, yes, sir. No, no. He's, <laughs> I haven't even talked to this man. The last time I talked to him, we was in, an, in a, a room in APD with a group of detectives. He wasn't, he was just sitting in. He was on the tail end of it. He and so now, that now that's my lead detective on, on at APD. Now I'm not saying that I would not look into anything you see because I've looked in on everything that you've mentioned to me, um, from Texas to Monroe and back everywhere. Okay, I follow up on every lead that y'all either sent my way, and I try to do as as much as I can. Okay. All right, well, Mr. Oz, let me just ask you this. If I had an investigator that I wanted to send and talk to someone, would it be you or would it be APD? APD has the original case, yes, ma'am. Everything I have is from y'all from what I've got to ground up on. So I need, they to, have I need to call David Foshe. And I'm going to call I'm him. I'm saying that we've never taken a case from the Alexander Police Department. This is just baffling to me because it's taken me, if I wouldn't have called you just today, I would not even know this. This okay. is just well, really I, baffling. Well, we've talked about this before that we will start from the beginning with this case. But no, sir. Fact, I've told you this before that we did not, we have not gotten anything from the out there, please, for me. No, sir. If you would have told me those same exact words before, I would have been on the phone. Okay. Yes, sir. I've, you've never told me that, Mr. Isles. Never. Uh, okay. No, sir. I would have been demanding them to do something or send you everything because I had faith in you. I have faith in you. And, and I would have demanded that them give you everything that you would have needed had I known this. So now that I know, I'm taking another avenue. And I'm going to get on the phone and try to find and get in touch with Mr. Foshi and tell him that you told me that's who was the last you heard was the lead detective. Okay. Now, like I said, that's the last I've heard was that was the lead detective. Well, wouldn't, if you're the lead detective with RPSO, uh, wouldn't you wouldn't, know who yes. the other detective is in, in APD? I mean, wouldn't y'all be together comparing notes or? Ma'am, I did not, again, I did not get anything from the Alexander Police Department. Okay. I was told that Detective okay. Foshi was working it, and I did not get nothing from Detective Foshi. Okay. Well, I'm going to find out about all that here in just a little while. Okay, well, I thank you for your time, Mr. Alls. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, y'all, listen. It's very important. And, and I, I know I have a room full of really upset people, family members here, as they should be, because they just heard that uh, conversation for the first time. But I need to just get my thoughts out, y'all, real quick before I lose them. Number one, um, before we even talk about the toxicology report, you heard Detective Isles state unequivocally several times that he could not get anything from Alexandria Police Department. Numerous times he said, Alexandria Police Department refused to give me anything. Now, you tell me why the sheriff's office can't get any cooperation from a local jurisdiction police department on a homicide, on a murder case. They refused. He stated, Detec Detective Isle stated, he said, ma'am, the only evidence I've ever gotten in this case is came for you and your family or for what I got from te Texas, from the sheriff's office in Texas. Alexandria PD refused to give me anything, and he said it numerous times. And I'm telling you, it's just bad, bad business. Now, now, 
here's the deal. I'm a, the, the, this toxicology report, we're only going to talk about it for a second because it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, uh, the death certificate says Courtney was murdered. It's a homicide. But what happened was when they did their original autopsy, a forensic pathologist and, uh, did it in Beaumont, Texas. And they, during the autopsy, they draw blood and they send it off to the lab for the work and for, you know, narcotics or anything else. The, the, so that, that forensic pathologist has custody over Courtney's body. Now, y'all, y'all have heard me in the past talk about when you open the body bag, it's sealed. It has a lock with a identifying tag on it. It's a chain of custody. It is everything in these cases. So Courtney's body goes from that warehouse in Winnie to when they would have bagged right on the scene, locked and sealed the bag, goes to wherever they they do the autopsy, and we have the original autopsy report. Hold on, y'all. There's a train coming by. Give me about two seconds. That <laughs> I just wanted the train to blow it off. But the so okay so the the forensic pathologist takes the chain of custody of Courtney's body. He Cuts open the thing. It's, it's, it's videotape or pictures are taken of it. Chain of custody is maintained. This is huge. It's a homicide. They draw the blood. It's sealed. It's sent to the lab. All done by standard operating procedures. These, are, this is not fly by the seat stuff here. This is done by professionals. They have guidelines that they have to follow. And you know why? Because of defense attorneys. If they mess it up, then, then they know they're going to lose it in court. And every rule that is in any handbook, whether it's an employee handbook or uh, a, a guidelines for a pathologist or whatever, every rule is there because somebody screwed something up at some point and they figured out, you know what, to stop this from happening again, we need a rule. So this pathologist follows the rules, sends it in the blood, comes back with a very trace amount of alcohol in the system, whether she had a drink or whether it's body decomposed and it caused it. I don't know, but that's your, that's your deal. That's your chain of custody. We know that chain of custody is good. And I'm going to be uploading it to the closed patron page. Y'all go look at it. We know that chain of custody is good. Now, what happened is I told y'all this last week, a couple years ago, Miss Stephanie contacted me about looking at Courtney's case. And when I, I told her I would, I would do it, but I needed case file information. She went in with family members and met with Detective Isles. And when she told them that I was coming, they, he was like, no, you don't want any outside people, et cetera. I'm, Ms. Stephanie, I'm going to let you tell this part. I'm going to turn this mic back up. Okay. Um, we were actually sitting in this same building we're sitting here now, and um, Detective Isles um, met with the family, and um, we, um, I told him about you, and I told him I was thinking of having someone else come in and look at Courtney's case with a new set of eyes, and he completely I shot that down he was like you don't know uh, anything about this man you you know there's a lot of people out there that you know try to get involved and you don't know anything about this man um, more or less let it go and so what what happens after that is I don't want to use the word magically because I don't think Detective Isles is a bad guy. I think he's got a he got a bad, he's got a what I would have called an acute political emergency, an ape. But magically, they call to Texas and supposedly get Courtney's blood retested twelve or thirteen years after the fact. After they know someone's coming from the outside to work the case, and lo and behold, here is a new toxicology report that they produced to the family, and basically. Brought him in and said, if, if, I, if I had to classify this death today, it would be an overdose. And let me tell you what was in the toxicology report. And you, know, you can get the specifics of the numbers 
uh, off the patron page. But the deal is, they said she had a huge amount of tramadol, which is a narcotic. When last week I said it's not a narcotic, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean it's not Schedule 2, but it's the Schedule 3 narcotic pain reliever. And a huge amount of alcohol, and that was something else that we got wrong last week. I said nine times, or Miss Stephanie said nine times, and it was four times what the legal limit is. And now the rest of the United States of America, your legal limit is was at, at the time point zero eight, and Louisiana it was still point zero one. They changed that uh, sometime in that time frame, but it's now it comes back that it had, I mean, an obscene amount of tramadol. Four times the legal limit, which means you're dead. Uh, and, uh, if we stop somebody on the street and they blew past a, a point, uh, zero three, you had to call an ambulance to take them to the hospital immediately because they were on death's door. Technically, what, what I was taught at, 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 at a, the four point or the point four, you're dead. So, and again, the original autopsy, she had, uh, Food in her stomach, uh, French fries and bubblegum, et cetera, showed she had eaten within two hours of, of being murdered. So to sum it up, this, and I think this is thing even said it had MDMA, which is X, the commonly street term X. See, it had everything but Jesus in her is what this report said. And the, or no, it didn't say marijuana. That was a, but I had some lifers out there who I've sent this information to. That are pathologists, uh, ER nurses, phlebotomists, however you say the person who draws blood, a couple of them, and they absolutely say no way for a multitude of reasons. But here's the deal. This, it's a very, very touchy subject for the family, and I get that. Uh, um, we are going to continue to look into this as we go on and, um, and get the information from the case file from Texas, because obviously we're not going to get it from Alexander PD. The, if Rapid Sheriff's Office couldn't do it. But we're going to put that to bed for now. All right. That whatever the toxicology report, me personally, I'm going with the, the doctor, the forensic pathologist that had the chain of custody of, of, of court in his body and did the initial blood test. Not somebody who called back 12 and a half years later and said, huh, can you run that blood? But it's very convenient that they run a blood toxicology for Courtney but yet you heard Detective Isle state that they have not run the DNA which was mixed with Courtney's DNA which was found on the latch of the trunk of the vehicle where her body was stored uh, probably and this is hard to hear and I'm sitting with the family probably uh, for those two days in, in the heat because her body showed advanced signs of decomposition when they found her and you know that's in the autopsy report it's undisputed so the blood or the, the dna that was on the handle of the trunk when they took her body out and they she was nude from the waist down they posed her legs open in, in what i would call a sexually degrading manner that i've worked on some cases in the past and they put the body where it could be seen in this abandoned warehouse. Now, listen to me. If you didn't know that the, if they would have moved it two feet to the either side, there's there's no way they'd ever found Courtney's body. Not for a long, long time. But a pipe worker, somebody, a, a, a worker that was there near that property on that Monday, Monday morning, saw her because they posed her. For her to be seen now uh, and to pose somebody in that manner is is absolutely 1000 percent to degrade them. It also could be send a message to other people. But let me back. I'm getting off track. The the her body was collected from there, taken in the original chain of custody, established and controlled, et cetera. Twelve years later, they don't call in after they come in. The, the family comes in and says, you know what? We're going to bring in our own people. Nothing's getting done. This magically, this new toxicology report shows up and they try to tell the family it's an overdose. If we had to classify it today, it would be an overdose. Y'all listen to this. They even went so far as to get a local pathologist to read this new toxicology report. And he just absolutely said Courtney had, you know, basically 
it was an overdose junkie type situation, et cetera. And he, he never saw Courtney. He's never seen the blood. He doesn't know anything about the chain of custody or anything else. Why would you go that far to do this, to get some local pathologist to give you an opinion on it? And with that, I'm not going to say any more about it because I could go on about it for hours. And these ladies here are furious as they should be. Um, but you know what? Again, I don't think Detective Biles is, is, is a bad guy. I really don't. I think he got handed this acute political emergency because his family went to the sheriff and the sheriff's, even you heard the grandmother say, the sheriff said, why hadn't anybody been arrested for this? Right. And, and, but his guys go to Alexandria PD who, who took all kinds of evidence from the house, which I'm putting that on the closed patron page. It's going to be a list of all the items they took from the house. All of them could have been DNA tested, cigarette butts, beer cans, Dr. Pepper cans, et cetera, uh, clothing and, Alexandria PD has done nothing. I can't wait to get my hands on the Texas file to see if they even turn that over to Texas. Because remember, the Texas Rabelais comes to town hoping to get some assistance and in, in interviewing suspects that are locked up in jail that he's got information on. And Alexandria Police Department shut him down. So this toxicology thing, I'm putting it to bed for now, y'all. But you go read it. The, the original toxicology report is going to be on the page. The new toxicology report is going to be on the page. It will come back up in this investigation. And when it does, we will address it accordingly. But until that time, we don't need to talk about it a whole lot more. Now, I want you lifers to do it. I want you to look at it, read it, send me your ideas. I know you're professionals out there in that field. And even you lay people who don't know anything about a toxicology report might have some good ideas and we need them. Y'all, we, we got to have your help. Now it's just so much information and so much to it and so much emotion in this room where I'm sitting right now. Um, but we're doing the right thing and we can do it with y'all's help. Again, back to detective Isles. I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he got handed a bum rap. Uh, um, his hands are tied behind his back. He made that point clear that Alexander PD refused to give him anything, everything he got, he got from the family or because he had to request it from the sheriff's office in Texas because he got stonewalled by Alexander PD. Alexander PD, I'm going to call. I'm calling next week. I'm here. I'm going to be in town. I'm coming to see you. I want to talk to somebody. And if you want to talk to me, I'm going to give more than help. I'd be more than happy to give you your, your chance to, to tell why you will not, you would not cooperate with the lead homicide detective from Texas on the case. And you wouldn't even cooperate with your own sheriff's office detectives who, who have been asked to look at the case. It's got to be a reason, right? So, uh, but we're, hey, we'll be fair. You tell me your side. I'll be more than happy to record it. Um, and ladies, I, I know it's been emotional and I know there, there, everybody has something they could say if we could do this all night, but put the toxicology thing to the side, detective Isles to the side, um, Stephanie, and I think that's a great piece of, uh, information you record in that phone call. And, 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 you know, and y'all just so you know, as long as one person that's a party of the conversation in the state of Louisiana is recording it, they give permission then it's legal. So we, nothing illegal was done there. And so, uh, that's it. You, everything you've heard has been unscripted and raw. Um, uh, y'all, the audio, but I don't, I won't have any idea what it's going to sound like until we play it back on that. I know there's, we're, we're blessed to use this building and you know, there's an ice machine in the back or whatever. Hopefully Cindy can edit some of that stuff out. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I apologize about the sound quality, et cetera, but you have the facts now and that's what's important. Uh, and we'll, we'll get better as we go along. Um, I just, I don't really know what else to say. Y'all want, want to say anything in closing or you just want to leave I just it? I want to say thank you, Mr. Woody. No, don't thank me. I, and, thank and Mr. Jim yeah. for right. actually. The, I want to thank the fans, the lifers for responding and, uh, that I have goosebumps. You really don't have to thank me. I, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in this to, I'm in it to win it to the end now for life. And, and hopefully, 
Y'all, the goal of this, this investigative series is not to bash Detective Isles. It's not to bash Alexandria PD. It's not to do any of that, right? But the goal is to push this case forward. It's frozen. We want to thaw it out. Then we want to make it hot. You know what? 15 years. And I mean, the familiar DNA and all these things that have come up, uh, uh, if they haven't worked or if they worked a DNA uh, profile and entered into CODIS off of Courtney's stuff. What do you think it'd be important to match that if, if we can match that to the items that were taken from our house, right? Give the case legs. And there are all kinds of, of things that can happen in this case, but I just think it's kind of been out of sight, out of mind. Now you bet your ass, and that's the first time I've cursed tonight, that if it was one of these people's family members, it wouldn't have gone cold. Okay. And they had got, they had got cooperation and they had came and picked them up in a limo at the airport and chauffeured them around and fed them and everything else. But that's hindsight's 2020. We need you lifers. We need you to get fired up. Courtney is so beautiful. Y'all, uh, I put, she, she does deserve answers, but she's so beautiful. I put, finally put, um, a picture of her yesterday on the regular crew page so y'all could see her. Um, and, uh, but there's a whole lot more on the private page, but just so young, so full of life and she was murdered and somebody's got to an answer for it. So y'all use the, the email. Um, uh, it will be in the show notes. The, um, you're doing this. You heard the family's pain and it's real. I mean, it's, it just doesn't get, imagine if it was your kids. Imagine if it was your, best friend that's that's your first cousin i mean let's do this and we, we've got to speak for courtney now all right and and it is what it is and so anybody y'all we, i'm and we're scratching the tip of the iceberg on this i'm personally going to be doing a reward guarantee myself we'll talk about that next week that i'm going to put up if you call in and you give information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the murder or murderers of, of Courtney Coco. Woody Overton is going to put up a significant amount himself. The family has some also, but I'm also going to be take getting donations or, or at least uh, promises from other business people and stuff that I'm going to reach out to. We're going to make this a big reward fund and maybe that'll get the, the loose lips to open up also. So let's do it. And I, I, I love and appreciate each and every one of y'all. Uh, oh, thank y'all, ladies. Yeah, thank you. And all the supporters. All the supporters. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, y'all. That's yes. huge. Um, supporters just from on behalf of our family. Like, I feel like you guys are sitting at this table with us with all this paperwork. I feel like you're going to go through this with all of this paperwork. Yes. And then I, I, I feel your passion. I've read your comments and yeah. my heart is beating out inside my chest for the, for the love you have for for Courtney and how you want to help us and I just I thank you as her as her aunt and on behalf of our family from yes. the bottom of our heart thank you so very much. Yes. So that's that's it and and I mean I got have goosebumps y'all. I didn't get any more real than that. Um you know you you listen to the other true crime podcasts and stuff and it's about cases that you know, you can Google and all that. This is real life and real crime. And I'm your host, Woody Overton. And till next time or ever, don't let me catch you down on murder by you. Thanks. Peace. Yeah, the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used to get you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? And the wolf is at your door. You're running so that's for sure.
Build up to Black Friday with savings all month long at Lowe's. Get up to 50% off select major appliances. Plus take an additional 10% off when you buy select major appliances. And don't wait to pick up holiday inflatables under $20. Don't wait to save. In store or online now. Because Lowe's knows deals. Valid 11.6 through 12.4. Cannot be combined with additional discounts. See Lowe's.com for details and qualifying items while supplies last. Build up to Black Friday with savings all month long at Lowe's. Get up to 50% off select major appliances. Plus take an additional 10% off when you buy select major appliances. And don't wait to pick up holiday inflatables under $20. Don't wait to save. In store or online now. Because Lowe's knows deals. Vowed 11.6 through 12.4. Cannot be combined with additional discounts. See Lowe's.com for details and qualifying items while supplies last.